Hey everybody, happy Tuesday. I'm so glad that you are continuing with this Kyle Eidelman series in 1 Peter today. That's a very powerful message and powerful reminder for us. Uh, I want to remind you about some other things that are happening in the life of our congregation. Uh, glad that you're here participating in this study of 1 Peter. I hope that you won't just watch the video. I hope you will watch the video, but I hope you won't just watch the video. I hope that you'll participate in one of our online or on-campus groups uh, that are reviewing the content of what is taught by uh, Pastor Eidelman. Uh, there's a, a sign-up link to participate in on online or on campus, and I hope you'll be a part of one of those groups. also want to remind you that tonight, Tuesday night, uh, August 4th at uh, 6.30, we're going to have an online gathering, just a good news gathering, praise report. If you've got something good to share that God is doing in your life, uh, or if you just want to tune in and hear good news uh, coming from others, we'd love for you to be a part of that. Uh, trying something new. There's no agenda. We don't know really what it'll be like, but we hope lots of folks will show up and share good news, and we'll just have a time of uh, fellowship and prayer. Uh, so that's uh, tonight at 630 um, there's a Zoom link in the email that goes along with this. And I also want to make sure that you are aware and, and ask you to share with folks uh, just a reminder that this Sunday we're going to do something different as part of our follow-up to the armor of God when Paul uh, tells us to always keep on praying in all situations. That's exactly what we're going to do. This Sunday our time of worship will be mobile, church on the move. We will be going out and praying over our community. Uh, praying for our, our educators and other schools, praying for care facilities, praying for local business, praying for peace in our streets, praying for other churches, uh, praying for the body of Christ that we would rise up and, 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 and work together to bring peace and hope and justice and unity in our community. And so um, uh, be ready for an email with uh, details on that. You'll be able to come to campus or download an audio file and, and just be sent out uh, around our town to, to be praying over our streets and our, our residents. And uh, we just hope it's a powerful time of worship and prayer. So be uh, looking for those details coming out uh, for worship this Sunday. But God bless you. I hope you're having a great week. Welcome to uh, the second installment on 1 Peter chapter 2. And I uh, hope you enjoy it. I hope you listen. It's a very wonderful and powerful message from Pastor Eidelman. Uh, God bless you. Have a great day. The letter of 1 Peter in the New Testament is written to exiled Christians. Peter, the apostle, is writing this letter to Christians who are living out their faith under severe persecution. This is taking place during the time of Nero. You probably remember hearing some things about Nero. He burned the city of Rome, and then he sang while the city of Rome burned, and it burned for nine days. He thought, this is the way to do it. I'll burn down the city and then I'll rebuild it bigger and better. The thing is, there wasn't a lot of consensus among the people when it came to this strategy. And so the people started to rebel. Nero needed somebody to blame for the burning of Rome. And so he blamed the Christians. And thus began an inhumane season of persecution upon the Christians. And during this time, Peter writes this letter. Nero would have had Christians sewn into the skins of wild animals, hunted down by dogs until they were killed. He would have had Christians covered in wax and then lit them on fire as a way to illuminate his gardens. Eventually, Peter, who wrote this letter that we're studying, he would be crucified upside down under Nero's persecution. And so Peter is writing to these Christians to help them so that they'll know, what do we do now? How should we respond to this increasing hostility and opposition? Peter begins, as we saw in chapter one, by reminding them, here's who you are. Don't be too dismayed and don't be too discouraged by what you're experiencing in this world because this world isn't your home. You're not citizens of earth, you're citizens of heaven. And because this is who you are, because this is your identity, 
then these are the implications. What was true for them is true if you're a follower of Jesus today. The world is not your home. You are a foreigner, a stranger, an alien, an exile. And if that is your identity, then there are implications to how you should live. Now look, if you're like me, right away you're thinking, okay, but my circumstances don't come close to comparing to what the Christians were going through in the first century. But you know what, now is the time to ask questions like, how are we gonna respond when what we believe or how we live isn't popular? What do we do when we increasingly feel like we're in the minority? So in chapter one, Peter gives us a motivation to live intentional, set apart lives for God, even in the midst of these trials. He talks about the fact that Jesus will return and we should live with this reverent fear and this constant awareness that he will come back. He talks about the fact that we've been ransomed by the blood of Jesus. And Peter says, you've been bought not with silver, not with gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. And because you've been bought by Jesus, then Jesus has every right to tell you how you should live tell you what you should do. So in chapter two, Peter gets a little more specific with what it means to live a holy life. Here's what he says. Therefore, in other words, because you've been called, live a holy life and get rid of or rid yourself of all malice. The word malice is it's kind of a generic term for evil deeds. It's a, a junk drawer term for all the sin in your life. I like the way the message paraphrases this. It says, because you've been called to live holy lives, then clean your house. And so the image then is cleaning out the junk drawer of sin. And then it gives some specifics as to what might be in that drawer. Peter says, get rid of all deceit and hypocrisy, envy, slander of every kind. And we begin to understand that part of living holy lives is getting rid of some things. And this is repentance language. The gospel calls us to repent, to get rid of sin. Peter gives us a list, but it's not meant to be all inclusive. It's not meant to be comprehensive. In other words, if your thing's not on that list, it doesn't mean it's not included. In fact, I'd say the thing you're thinking of right now, that's probably on the list as well. There's a number of such lists in scripture. And so the question to wrestle with is, What's in your junk drawer that you need to get rid of so that you can live out your identity as a follower of Jesus in this world? Verse two, he says, like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted and seen that the Lord is good. And so Peter says, first, here are some things you need to get rid of. And then in verse two, he says, here are some things you should crave. You should crave godliness so that you can mature in your faith, so that you can grow up. And here's the reason why you should crave it. It's because you've tasted it. You've tasted and seen that the Lord is good. And once you've tasted his goodness, then it should create an appetite for godliness, a desire for godly living. If Peter was writing these things to people who weren't Christians, people who had not tasted and seen that the Lord is good, people who had not encountered the good news of the gospel, then telling them things like, well, hey, this is how you should live, and this is what you need to get rid of, that's gonna come off as presumptuous, maybe even offensive, it's not gonna be effective, and they're not gonna be interested. But if you're a Christian who has been ransomed by the blood of Jesus, who has tasted and seen the goodness of God, then you should crave living a godly life. And so what we find is that holiness is not just what we get rid of, it's what we chase after. Now, I think a lot of us probably grew up thinking that holiness was mostly just getting rid of stuff. It's basically a long list of things that we don't do. But Peter says that's not all of it. It's what you pursue, it's what you crave. It's not just what you run from, it's what you chase after. And so Peter is addressing Christians in this letter and he reminds them that they have been given a new identity, that they are a new people. And he describes them in verse four and five as a royal priesthood. Peter writes it like this. He says, as you come to him, the living stone, 
rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a royal priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So again, more identity language. This is Peter telling them who they are because what we do always flows out of who we are. But he doesn't stop with just the identity. He goes on to give them their responsibilities because any role that you have comes with a responsibility. And so Peter writes to them as God's chosen people and he tells them what they're to do. Look at verse nine and 10. He says, you're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, that you're God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. In verse 10, he says, once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And so Peter says that we, as God's chosen people, who've received mercy, we are to declare his praises, even in the midst of suffering, even in the midst of persecution and hostility. In other words, because of who we are and because of what God has done for us, we are to speak out for him, to declare his goodness. One paraphrase puts it this way, that we are to tell others of the night and day difference that he has made. That's a lot different than saying to somebody, you're wrong, I'm right. You tell others instead, hey, here's the difference God has made in my life. It takes some vulnerability. It takes some humility. How God took me from nothing to something, from rejected to accepted. Here's how I've experienced his mercy. This is the spirit of humility that must mark followers of Jesus in a culture that is antagonistic, that we are humble, we are vulnerable, we speak about the difference that God has made in our lives, and the difference that he has made in our marriages, in our struggles, in our brokenness, in our relationships. We say to people, I used to be this way, but Jesus has made me this way. So Peter calls us to live holy lives so that people will see a difference and we'll have an opportunity then to tell about the night and day difference that God has made in us. Verse 11 and 12, Peter's gonna double down on all of this. He says, dear friends, I urge you, more identity language, as foreigners and exiles, to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day that Jesus returns, on the day that God visits. The message, again, it paraphrases it this way. It says, the world is not your home, so don't make yourselves cozy in it. Don't indulge your ego at the expense of your soul. Look, it's embarrassing to feel left out. It's humbling to be stereotyped by social media, by maybe students at school or coworkers. It's embarrassing to be mocked for an unpopular belief. And there's part of us that wants to fight back, to get defensive because there's a lot at stake, and yet there's a lot more at stake than our pride or our being offended. And so Peter says, instead of responding that way, live an exemplary life among the natives. You're a foreigner, they're natives, so you live an exemplary life among the natives so that, he says, your actions will refute their prejudices. Through Christ, we have been remade and now we're called into something new. We have been called out to be God's message in this broken world. We are aliens and our lives should look different from those who do not belong to Jesus. So live your life in such a way that when people who don't follow Jesus see how you're living, it will refute the prejudices that they have. And then Peter says they will be won over and one day they will give glory to God when Jesus returns.